Welcome back. You're listening to another episode of The Todd Donald Show, a weekly podcast where artists and performers go to chat about nothing. Hosted by Canadian singer-songwriter Todd Donald. This is one of two TDS convos, this and another in a few weeks, where you're going to hear podcasters talk about a wealth of things, making jokes with each other, but where there's a bit of a focus on and workshop with regarding to uh, the wonderful world of making a podcast, from interviewing and conversing as well as delivering it. I really would like to think of it as being an advantage to you. Not only do you get to be a fly on the wall while two musical legends talk about becoming podcast legends, uh, maybe a humble version of that instead, but you get that as well as an insight or a backstage pass to the kind of things that we think about while talking with people and simultaneously creating something special, which to me is fascinating. Let me add that Rob Zabo, my guest on this episode, is a good friend of many years, someone I adore as a human being, a person, also as a music producer, and so much more he does, robzabo.com. It's written very well there. And firstly, only meaning as early as it was meeting him, I adore that movo for being one of the best singer-songwriters that you could ever hear. Rob has been on this podcast before, Winter 18, and you can listen to our conversation in episode 12. Following up to now, Rob is the host of his own podcast that launched in February, and it's called And Sometimes Why with Rob Zabo. It's fucking outstanding. This is really more of a discussion between him and I than an interview, and I'm sorry. I really have been trying to get over high roading the interview but this wonderful discussion happened and i only ever feel like i'm scratching the surface with rob anyway on the show but that just means that you can get more of both of us by subscribing to both podcasts and listening endlessly so listen to and enjoy our most recent chat knowing that immediately after publishing it today june 25th i'm going to enjoy this shit out of being post quarantine during my visit back home in kw sort of directing this to my larger circle, I'm driving my car again, which feels really amazing after six months of being in the Arctic, and that you should all embrace being around trees, and even just geographically, each other. So, zivity babbo here come to Zabo. Hey, buddy. <laughs> hey, Todd. How's it going, man? Good, good, good. We are so vastly far away from each other that I can't even imagine, other than you know your place, what it looks like out over there. I've forgotten what trees look like. I'm in the Arctic, as you know, man. Isn't it crazy? Like I, I imagine here we are talking to each other real time, and we're a continent apart essentially. And 200 years ago, it would take people generations to get there, and you know several people would have died on the way and that kind of thing. And we're just talking like, yeah. hey. What are you wearing? <laughs> I like that Seinfeld joke about summer vacation because, like, they would spend like ten years traveling to a place. Yeah, they would yeah. have a nice summer, and then their lives would be over. <laughs> right, right. How are you today? I understand it's middle of May when we're recording this. Are you enjoying the warmth of June, or do you want to talk about now? Because I understand. And happy belated, by the way. It's your birthday weekend. Thanks, Todd. Yeah, we we had a great weather right. here. It's a long weekend, and we're socially distancing and isolating like everyone is. And we've been pretty what strict. <laughs> well, we, well, yeah, what do you mean? Yeah. Yeah. Like many people are, but we, we live in a 700 square foot condo, downtown Toronto. And so if the weather's not good, we have one less room in the house. Cause our patio is like a, a whole other right. room. So we had great weather. So it was, it, it's, you know, it's big. We, we can sit on the patio and get sun on our skin. That's nice. Yeah. Well, what, typically does the weekend mean and i you know i i, I know you and i and i know a, f a few things that you keep busy doing and like what does what does the weekend mean you got to be constantly working in some way totally yeah i love that question because i've been self-employed since i got out of high school and so i've always had my own rhythm and when i lived alone you know i'd, I'd stay up till four or five and just kind of go with whatever i was energized about and just work like basically all day long and all night. And, <laughs> and you know, whenever I absolutely had to do something that involved other people, I'd go and do that. Whereas now, you know, I've been in a relationship for almost 20 years. And so we live together in this small space. And especially now that we're quarantined together, you know, the rhythms have to sync up in some way. So I can't just work whenever I want. So uh, 
that's a big part of it. So if you ask what the weekend is, is when Kat, my partner, is off and not working, then you know I adjust and I, I kind of make my work fit around that. That's a good human move. Like that's a good evolved human move. I bet. I bet. I'm not, I don't like gambling, but I, I would bet that any musician at a certain age is, would be so obsessed that you couldn't imagine <laughs> disciplining yourself to be like, okay, the work stops here. Partner time is happening. I find it actually really useful to have limits, limitations in that way, or I don't even look at it that way. Like it's a blessing. If you have unlimited time, there's some kind of rule of the universe that you fill whatever time you have with whatever tax you have available, right? So I find if I have right. limits, it forces me to get stuff done in a different way. So it's it's actually really helpful. Well, it, it certainly makes it a better life, as, as I'm sure you know. Yeah, yeah. And that, like, never mind that cat is super fun and, you know, she's the love of my life and, and to spend time with her is, is a gift in so many ways. So, like, I'm certainly not throwing my brow and dragging my heels. I'm, I'm excited to go and do something else when I'm done killing myself with whatever thing I've decided is super important, <laughs> right? Yeah. Speaking of Kat, I believe she was on a podcast recently, a certain podcast named And Sometimes Why, which we're going to talk about in a little bit, hosted by you. I think it's a fantastic show. Before that, like, does she ever have to tell you, like, even now, that, like, Rob, you haven't eaten in eight hours? Put down um, the headphones. You look like Lon Chaney in the 1930s. <laughs> I'm a lot better at it than I used to be. I used to go for long stretches with it, like, eating or going to the bathroom because I was so obsessed with whatever it was. But now I'm, I can actually kind of look around and, and, you know, hey, dude, you should probably eat, that kind of thing. So I'm, I'm over that hump. Mm-hmm. One statement I'll make for for them, I, I'm sure you know this about me, is that I fucking think the work that you do when you are focusing on it is stellar. You know, it, you, you, you know when to say it's finished, but when it's finished, it sounds like there was a lot of care and intelligence and talent and wildness and brilliance. Thank you so much, Todd. That's That's really flattering to hear coming from you you know, from a peer, you know, as a musician to, to hear other people mm-hmm. who have dedicated their lives to, to doing something in the same world that you feel appreciated. So yeah, that's, that's huge. So I went to Toronto last fall. You've been recording interviews for your podcast for quite a few months before launching, right? Yeah. And um, before we got started, because th- that, that was my chance to be a guest on the show. And we had to do it in person because we hadn't seen each other in so long. And it was a really nice time. We grabbed coffee at this splendid little place. Red Eye. It's a place we that went, you go we to. We went to Red Eye. Red Eye? Yeah, a little ma and pa near my place. It's on McCall, actually, near uh, OCAD University. Definitely go there if you're ever in Toronto. Five stars, send me free beans. I loved the coffee. <laughs> yeah, I love that you remember that and that you focus on that. That's <laughs> so great. It's funny what, you know, in your life as you get older, you appreciate little things, right? Oh, yeah. That plus the fact that it's ritualistic for me. And I wanted to ask you about that. Like, this is the evening, right, that we're recording. But do you have a thing where you need to have coffee in the morning? Or is it just why well, I like coffee and... No, it's, I'm not, I'm not a nut. So like I actually came to coffee pretty late in life. Like I think in my mid to late thirties, actually, I never really got on a, I need to have it to wake up kind of vibe. Now it's more like a little break in my day that I look forward to just purely because it's yummy (laughs) because it tastes good, you know, which is kind of a funny thing because a lot of people will, will argue with that and say, you know, coffee's not actually that tasty. It's just, it's just a drug. Right. But it works for me, (laughs) but I can't have too much. I can have Um, like one a day. If I have more than that, it's just, it feels like my hair's growing and I just gnaw my teeth. Yeah. You know what? I wouldn't even say that I need it like a drug. I'm ritualistic with having a delicious hot beverage and it depends on the coffee right because some places taste like hot water and some they have notes of dark chocolate and it's a really nice tasting thing but i've made it part of my routine because of what it has in it right because it's diuretic and it's uh, (laughs) now you got onto a whole other level there yeah yeah that's yeah that's a useful property i've been on to the oat milk lately and i have a a frother right and that's a whole other level in terms of like your own latte kind of it's it's great i'm fighting affection what you got oh did i mention what i got i'm digging up weeds to find a plot just like i'm watching
Whoa there. Sorry about the delightful interruption of the Rob Zabo song, Watching a Movie, from the 2003 album The Battery of Tests, currently available on Bandcamp.com, as well as easy access clickable links on every episode description of this podcast available. Stay tuned for more Rob Zabo-themed interruptions like this here and there. We now go back to our conversation, currently in progress. Do you have a morning ritual? Because I'm sure you don't just like fall out of bed and put the headphones on. Yeah, yeah. Over COVID, I've been basically since the start of the year, I've been working out almost every day, first thing. I've been trying to eat less meat, less uh, animal products. So I'm, I've been doing like steel cut oats with a bunch of healthy stuff like nuts and seeds. Uh-huh. That's been my morning ritual. It's been working pretty well. That is a good time of the day to do it. Let's, you and I right now, we're doing a physical health, mental health podcast. <laughs> Start, start, <laughs> seems like a, it's start. like Tim Ferriss, you know, <clears throat> break down your day, yeah. starting, starting when you wake up, go pump up songs, top five. Yeah. yeah. Uh, just <laughs> speaking of COVID-19, what is that exactly? I want to know what happened with COVID one through 18. I, I, uh, the ones that failed. Have no, you been watching know. the news though? I, I really have to limit what I take in. I really try and take in only the bare minimum of, okay, what's happening? Exactly. What's, what do I really need to know? Yes. And then I'm done because beyond that, it's really not useful. I'm finding. It's not good for hashtag mental health. I don't, you know, I, I don't, if people steep themselves in it, they're just going to feel bad. And that's not a good way to spend this time if there's all these silver linings to be found. I agree. I agree. Yeah, you, I, you definitely have to. Well, I find I have to limit it for myself. Yeah, 100%. I want to know. Every couple of days, I'll be like, I'll spend five minutes. Just, is there a vaccine? No. Okay. What else? Okay, this is not doing anything for me. Yeah, yeah. That's totally how um, I approach it. Or, you know, every Monday when there's a new announcement from either the government of Canada or government of Ontario and they're, you know, when are things going to start opening up or what's the approach, that kind of thing. You know, mm-hmm. is there any new information? No? Okay, great. See you yeah. next Monday. Funnily enough, I bet just to spite me, they'll come up with a vaccine that will be available before this podcast goes up. That would be just my luck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it doesn't seem likely. All right, well... I do want to talk to you uh, about podcasting, your podcast, making a podcast. And I have had enough of me talking up to this point even, but there's something that I wanted to tell you. Okay. I met you in 05, right? It was at Graffiti's. I was playing a gig with Kristen Latham and Scott Cooper. I remember. You had a crutch at the time. Did you sprain your ankle or something? I broke it. I broke my, I forget oh. which bone. It That's was even worse. bone in my heel. Yeah, yeah. It was, yeah, beyond. Right. Yeah. Oh, well, you're better now, right? That's good. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. 15 years later. Totally insensitively said. <laughs> yeah. And I saw you play not too long after that, but I'm sure, you know, that night I went home and I was listening to you on MySpace. And if not, uh, Kristen was playing her CD in the car and I was, I was like, holy shit, I just met that guy. And uh, there was the New Year's Eve show at the Rivoli in Toronto with Peter Katz. And uh, I was definitely hella awkward. I I would call it an unconscious, conscious decision to just be socially deficited. Just younger than I am now. Younger, which isn't a crime, right? Yeah, we all, <laughs> you, you go through and I, an evolution. Over and over again, there would be these intense interactions because it would be so rare that I would see people, and especially with people in Toronto. So people I admired weren't necessarily a regular part of my everyday thing, but I would be listening to your musics. And every time it would be like after a show, you know, those times that we've talked about where everyone needs to be able to talk to everyone there. And whenever I had the floor with either of you, I'd be like, <laughs> I don't know what I'm asking of you, but there's nothing you can do or say that will validate me enough to not seek it anymore. And every time after that, for the next decade, it seemed maybe less that on the rare occasions that we would see each other over the years, whatever I was feeling wanting to say or ask was too intense for me to handle. And you were always also kind about it despite this and always giving that encouragement. And, um, and it was nice. And it has to do with putting people on a pedestal at that age. Mm -hmm. So since then I've been long through evolutions and all that. So I've had time to, to be embarrassed about all that. I'm fine. More years are going by. And then after I had you on the, the podcast episode 12 listen to it you approached me about editing 
your own podcast. And that's put us in a place where like we're regularly talking to each other. And there's a part of me in my 20s that's still in my being that's admiring and being proud of myself for the fact that like most times we talk, it's easygoing and fun. And I don't remember what it's like to need validation from my peers or and I just think that's really nice. Well, isn't it great to talk to someone know. that's that you share an aesthetic with or that you share a common goal and you're working together on a project? That's what I find yeah. m- my most gratifying relationships tend to be built around, you know, built around a project. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't that's know. I find it really, really gratifying because, you know, you have a common goal and your, your, your conversations are really centered around, okay, how do we get this done? What are we doing next? You know? Yeah. In between them, there's, you know, plenty of occasions where we can just talk casually and that, that's pretty cool too. Yeah, totally. And I, I, speak- listen, I can't thank you enough for taking on the task of editing those conversations because like I've said repeatedly, I really couldn't do it without you. I find that especially as the person having the conversations, like I wonder how you deal with that yourself in your podcast, because like as a producer, that's sort of one of the fundamental principles is if you're too close to it, it's so hard to be objective. So if you're the one having the conversation, you're probably not, you know, fit to edit it, which is one of the main reasons I'm so grateful to you for being the one to take that on, right? Mm Mm-hmm. But, you know, we get to keep the raw tracks, right? So sure, I, of course. I always think of, why is this moment exciting? Is it exciting because it excites me or it'll excite everybody? That's how you make decisions about what to cut. It's not just about excitement. It's interest. Is the audience able to hear this and experience a moment without having been there? I go on for a few minutes here. And we're back. Well, anyway, <laughs> I, I can't thank you enough for, for being part of the the show and and making it happen like like i say I, like i've said i i couldn't do it without you man i'm i'm really really thankful you're welcome man it, it gives me the chance to be like the second or third counting cat set of ears on all these which is a privilege too and it's exquisite and i get to hear them uncut right um and for the record cat doesn't and, hear um, them she only hears them when they're done she she's not she's got other things to do man she doesn't listen to the raw stuff <laughs> I'm just imagining like, like, I'm in the room and I don't want to hear it. <laughs> Headphones. <laughs> oh, no, no. Like, it, she's not around when it's happening. Like, right now, she's she's in the other room. She's doing her own thing. There's nothing like an exquisite, in-depth chat. Uh, it's been available since February. It's called And Sometimes Why. I don't think you need to punctuate it when you search for it, because you'll find it. But the title is And Sometimes dot, 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 the question why, in a question mark, with Rob Zabo. I do edit the conversations, but I also listen to everything. And I, I'm a genuine fan of like the person you are, Rob, when you're having these conversations. And as the guests have praised, you're a very good active listener. You ask insightful questions. The guests are also fantastic. Thanks so much for the kind words. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks, Todd. Yeah, I, I agree with what you're saying. I, like one of the things I've been trying to do is get a w- bit of a range of people. So it's not just musicians. It's entrepreneurs it's people in different areas and everyone's got a story to tell and it's i don't know my whole life i've been the kind of person who i don't know what it is it's like a weird mental tick maybe i i kind of walk around my days daydreaming about conversations i've either had with people or that i'd like to have or you know embellishing or continuing conversations that actually happened in real life and then, you know, building on them. I don't know what that is. I'm just, uh, you know, a lot of it has to do with just exploring ideas, but yeah, I could go on. I mean, I can relate. I I think that makes for more interesting podcasting when the host is, when the level of neurosis is Is high. um, (laughs) Above average. Would well, you think say. it's neurosis? That's I, an interesting thing. I, I've, I've had no, this, I don't. <laughs> but I, I actually do to some degree, and I, I'm not just trying to be funny. Like, for instance, this is a conversation Steve, my friend, and I have had a ton of times about people who get to a high level at sports or musicianship. There's always got to be a bit of an OCD thing happening because in order to be compelled to, you know, in practice, you know, not good enough, do it again, not good enough, do it again. You have to do that repeatedly at a, 
an obsessive level in order to get right. to a high level in any sphere. So you talk about neurosis. I think you can't have one without the other. I mean, what do you, what do you think? If only for the sake that it it, I don't I don't want a high road. I don't even know what your average person means, but I think there's something kind of more interesting about the personalities of someone who thinks that way or looks at the world with the thought process of of that kind of analysis. I don't know. I'll, I'll think tomorrow about a better way I could have said what yeah, I just yeah, said. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I agree. I'm totally like that. Totally like that. Yeah. In the moment. Do you ever I wish you could like, yeah. Go ahead. Oh, do, do you ever wish that you could record the thing that you wanted to say better and add it to the <laughs> podcast instead of what you actually asked the person? Yeah, oh, yeah. I've actually thought about doing it, especially right. during the Zoom calls. I mean, I could actually do that because I'm I'm in the same environment. So the, the whatever sound I have going on, I could actually go back and redo the question. I haven't done that yet, but... You know, right. and then I kind of take a few steps back and ask myself, so what would that improve? Would that improve the experience for the listener? You know, what's important here? And so what I've gotten to, because I've thought about it, is, well, it would help me express my idea better. That's worth something. So I don't know. Right. Maybe I'll get there. <laughs> I feel even weirder saying this in the time of brands or people because it's just the way i look at media and the things i'm interested in i feel like there's something more truthful hearing imperfect moments you're listening to a person find their thoughts and discover what they're trying to say in that moment yeah i totally hear what you're saying i I agree i like scripted doesn't appeal to me at all the the idea of trying to get what you just said 100%. Although it's interesting to hear you say that because you started by saying you wish you could go back and redo the question that you asked someone. And and (laughs) I I can totally relate. And I guess I feel like I'm, tell me if I'm wrong, I'm adding to the thought that you had or kind of going off on the same tree limb. For me, it's all about nuance. So if I was trying to express something in in particular, something nuanced in the moment, and I didn't really get there, that's when I want to redo it. Because I feel like in the time that I had to rethink it, I got to the heart of what I was trying to say. I'd like to be able to express that at some point, you know? Yeah. So, uh, well, it's that, it's, it's, you, you, you record music, man. Yeah, yeah. Like you know that that you can do multiple takes of something if you want to. You and I can both do that trick if we wanted mm-hmm. to, but we don't. That gets us to a bigger discussion about, you know, musicians talk about yeah. this all day long, which is, you know, the live first take versus doing endless takes to try and get it quote unquote perfect. And often that ends up diluting the original energy. But then the kind of nuance that I'm trying to get to is the gray area in between where you know, maybe you didn't refine the idea to the point that you should have. And so what you're trying to do by doing multiple takes is actually get to that little bit of extra expression or or expressing it in just the right shade that you can often only get to with refining. And usually that means doing it more than once, but sometimes it doesn't. There definitely is magic to trying to capture the moment. I feel like it's a balance. I don't think there's one that's definitively better than the other. I mean, every human is unique and wonderful. And one day you or I are going to get a guest that wants to be re-asked the question. Right. I, I could see that. I could see that. I could see myself wanting that. I, I, so Mark Marin, the, the godfather, the podfather, I remember him talking about someone, a famous film director, I think, who he had on who won't agree to have the conversation that they had released because he's not happy with it. (laughs) And so that's kind of the ultimate extension of that thought process, right? He wants to redo it. He wants to have ultimate control. So, you know, that seems excessive. He wants the director's cut. Yeah, he wants the director's cut, right? One, two, three, four. You should be there by now. You talk about it all the time. Ah, 
not this machine. <laughs> Once again, we've been interrupted by the sweet sounds of Rob Zabo. This time it was from the 2006 album Like a Metaphor. The song Break and Even not only received significant airplay, fun fact, but was animated into a killer music video by the amazing Cal Brunker. Visit robzabo.com and or search Rob Zabo on YouTube. Hell, if you're a fan of this podcast, you've already seen it. I'm curious to know, and this is more about your experience doing it. To run through the timeline again, you've been wanting to do one for many years. Totally correct. You've been recording conversations as far back as what, last summer? Yeah, that's right. I was just going to say, I was involved with Pat Lackenbauer's Moving Air podcast from the get-go, like from the time he started that. And I think that would have been 2014. And the original idea was for us to do that together. You know, I I made the intro for that, like the music part of that. And Mm -hmm. I was going to be more intimately involved, but it didn't end up going that way. And I kind of regret that in some ways because... That was a, a little before, not as early as you, you know, you started yours in 2008 and that was way ahead of the curve. But, you know, 2014 certainly was a few years ahead of when, you know, everybody and their brother was doing one. And it's, it's funny, as, right. as soon as that comes out of my mouth, I say, I've been looking at some stats more than, I think the number is 60% of the American public has never heard a podcast yet, has yet to listen to one. <laughs> And it's so funny for right. people like us who are, you know, involved in it. We just think, oh, it's ubiquitous. Everyone listens to podcasts all the time, but it's it's a particular kind of person. A lot of people don't even know how to use the app on their phone. They've never done it. So I don't know. Yeah. I, I, on the one hand, I feel like I'm a bit late to the game. But on the other hand, I feel like, well, you know, maybe the work that's cut out for me is to teach people who've yet to listen to a podcast about how great podcasts are and get them, you know, excited about it that way. You're absolutely right about that, in my opinion. And I've been too lazy to, to really try. I think I put it out there. Like, does anyone think it would be a good idea for me to, to do something cool that'll do that? If you do it, I'll just, I'll, I'll, I'll take what you do and, and make it my own. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> I'm kidding. Done. But that, that is a really good idea. I th- think it might be a matter of perspective too because like i remember finding out about a podcast that started in 2010 and i'm listening to the early episodes and 10 years ago you know the hosts of some of these podcasts felt like then that everyone and their mom was doing it oh totally it it seems to just grow and grow and grow and i think part of that might be for me that feeling i would think of the optimal amount of content like with anything movies uh television shows to be (laughs) an amount that I could be aware of if I'm selecting the things that I want to intake over the course of my life, I'll be able to take in all that I want it and at least be aware of pretty much everything else that's out there. Right. But I think I see where you're going with this. I think we're over that hump. <laughs> we're over yeah, that hump. Television shows, movies, movies, music. There's this, it's there's no <laughs> way you can't. It's overwhelming. There, <laughs> there, there's no possible way that everything that you would be salivating over could fit into one's life. It's, yeah, yeah. it's incredible. I have a friend who, who um, listened, who's an avid podcast listener, and he listens to all the podcasts he listens to at double speed because otherwise he doesn't have enough time. <laughs> Isn't that right. not so? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't get that. I don't judge people who do that. I, I, you know, I'm not judging at all. In real time, I, so. I, I'm, it, I think it underlines the problem of supply that you're describing in a really right. poignant way. It's not because he doesn't savor it. I think it's just because he's got so much he wants to listen to that he's he can't he can't get it to it all. And you know, I wasn't an adult in the the '60s when there were only two channels and ten television shows. But yeah. I I wonder if back then they were like, I just wish there were hundreds more. Well, I remember feeling that in it, in like the '80s on TV. That was kind of the overwhelming feeling, you know, growing up in the suburbs in Kitchener and feeling like none of this represents me. This is all so middle of the road and so kind of pedestrian, you know, uh, pandering to the lowest common denominator. And I remember being really frustrated with that in music and in in almost everything. And now it's it's kind of the opposite. It's all niche. You can find absolutely anything that kind of caters to your aesthetic, which is wonderful. But it's like you said, it's overwhelming, right? Yeah. 
I didn't embrace being in the middle of that. Like when it was, oh, there's so, there's so much I can find. I can find a wealth of things to enjoy in, in all forms of media, but it's not too much and it's not too little. When, like, when did that happen? I just want to live in that year forever. I'm kidding. I don't know. But, maybe, maybe we're there, we're there now in some ways, meaning the channels are well established for anyone to get their message out yeah. in almost every medium. So it's all just about finding your tribe, I guess. Do you think that's You're fair to say? Right. Just going back to the thing that we were saying before about like uh, f- failing to communicate in the best way until you figure out the best way to say it later. Mm-hmm. This happened when I was on your show. There were so many things, including the thing that we're talking about right now. I just put a spin on it. Like it was my spin, but it was one angle of my spin. It was one side. It was one shade of how I feel about something. Uh-huh. Let me give you an example. Here's more of me talking. Great. Uh, <laughs> but th- there was something about like, is music important? I put the bleak feeling of people going to a store. They-, they need food and clothes and whatever more than they need music. That's not good if you want to be an artist. That's only good if you make clothes or sell clothes or whatever. Something like that, right? Yeah, I remember that. And I heard you expressing the, the other side. It was either a devil's advocate argument or it was the more optimistic side. In my head, I said, yeah, that is also how I feel. I feel more than one way about anything. But if I hear myself saying only one shade of how I feel... And that's what goes out there. I wonder if the one person listening to this episode is thinking that I only feel negatively about stuff. Right, right. I, I, I totally hear uh, what you're what saying. You I totally, that really resonates with me. And I think that's an important thing to think about at this stage in how media covers things and how everything is so polarized. And just just acknowledging that human beings are complex and we all can often argue more than one angle on any particular topic. And there's so much nuance there. Yeah, I, I really relate to that. How much trust do you put in the listener? Say you and me mention the circus room, right? Okay, the bar in Kitchener. and Kitchener. It just happened right now. Earlier, I mentioned meeting you at Graffiti's in Toronto. Uh-huh. Do you trust the listener to be okay with not knowing where that place is, its relevance to you, its importance. I, I see what you're asking. I, mean, um, I definitely, I don't know that I would characterize it as trust the listener. I probably think of what my responsibility is as the person who's trying to communicate something to people who don't know the backstory. And I right. often find myself doing that as the host, making sure that, like when you mentioned the circus room, that was my impulse is to say, oh, that bar restaurant that was well-known for live music in the 90s in Kitchener-Waterloo, Ontario, just so that no matter where anyone's listening, they know what you're talking about. As opposed to, you know, if you mention like the Viper Room in LA or something, you know, maybe five out of 10 people might know what it is. But, you know, someplace that's less known. And, you know, we could get into the whole how good the U.S., the Americans are at, you know, self-mythologizing versus how good we are as Canadians. <laughs> and that's a whole other discussion. But for the time being, I just think about communication. You know, what's my responsibility and how can I communicate so it tells the best story? I can take that. For me, I can tell you that, don't take this the wrong way. There are things that I enjoy about editing and I love editing and being a part of your podcast. But when it comes to making a podcast, probably the most satisfying the most enjoyable part has to be getting together either covid style or in person with another person and like having this i could agree more yeah absolutely what's been the most surprising thing for you well off the top of my head one thing that i find surprising is how willing people are to talk when you ask them a question If you'd asked me before I started doing this, and now I've done probably 20 plus conversations with people, I might have guessed that people were more reserved, that you would have to prod them more to share their lives. And I'm finding the opposite. I'm finding that people really want to tell their stories and you actually have to direct them in some ways or not so much stop them. And and that's not really my overwhelming feeling. It's more like, People really just want to just want to talk. 
and it's it's exciting, right? And so sometimes, I guess the reason my impulse in some ways is to control it is that earlier on, I would have three hour long conversations and just in practical terms, in terms of putting it out in the world, it's just too long. And so what I don't want to have is, you know, three or four hour conversations and have to like pass it off to you to make sense of, to cut it down to one hour. Cause that's, it's just not manageable. So I'm learning to ride the balance between giving people the floor and really letting them talk about what they want to talk about and express themselves and get to something that matters to them. But at the same time, kind of corral it so that it's manageable. So I'm learning. Yeah. It can be a fun thing to I don't know, yeah, train yeah. yourself on. If I've done that at all, for sure, it's been through the experience of doing it. I'm sure you're learning a million more things oh, totally. per combo. Absolutely. But it really is it's different every time. With the, you know, um, everyone's got a different style and everyone responds to different things. And so in the moment, it's very, you know, it's very dynamic. Right. I was editing one recently Mm -hmm. for And Sometimes Why. The guest was Rebecca Black. She used to do like marketing for in the music industry in the in the early two thousands. Yeah, I I love talking to Rebecca. She's there's so many things to admire about her. Mm -hmm. Just as you were saying, like she was one of those people that was willing to talk. But one of the first things that you talked about was her inclination, maybe to say that she doesn't find herself or to think that she's interesting. And that's something that you noticed was a thread common in in most female guests. It's more common in females than males. So it's not every female guest, but it's, you know, over the numbers. When you look at the numbers, very few men say it, more women say it. The reason I'm I'm mentioning that is because she said near the end, and I believe these are the words, I'm not good at this interview thing. The idea that she's not interesting completely untrue in my opinion the idea that she's not getting good at doing an interview completely untrue in my opinion and i had to chop mm-hmm. stuff away from that she's a delightfully interesting person oh absolutely uh, wouldn't you agree no question absolutely good question, Todd. <laughs> yeah that that ties right into what we were talking about what's something that you're learning about our species through having had the conversations that you've had so far one of the things, and this was actually brought to my attention by Emma Julian, who was episode number two, second conversation I published. She brought this up and it really resonated with me and I totally agree with it. She she said, you often talk about people uh, from the point of view of confidence. And I'm often asking about key moments in their life, how they felt at the time and what it was like to make a big decision and I'll often say something along the lines of what you know weren't you scared wasn't it scary to do whatever it was that you did the way she framed it was well you know isn't it almost always the case that people are afraid to do whatever it is but they do it anyway it's not that they've got this innate confidence that's like a immutable part of their personality it's more like they're afraid and they right. overcome the fear and then they kind of move on it's not that they're kind of just bashing their way through life out of sheer confidence. And yeah, that, that would probably make me look at things differently. And it's, it's not like something I'd never considered. It's just that it comes up so often. And when you look at it through that lens, it's kind of, wow, every conversation has some element of that. How did you overcome that fear as opposed to how come you're so confident? Mm-hmm. And until you recorded the interview with Peter Katz, that what that went up recently uh-huh. to, to now, mid-May. Were you afraid to get to know him before now? Before that I, happened? I don't know what you mean. Were, was I afraid to get to know him? There's this beautiful group of things over several years that you and Peter have done together. You've co-wrote mm-hmm. a shit ton of songs, uh, worked on records together. You went mm-hmm. touring a bunch. I couldn't fucking believe my ears when at the end... I feel like we just got to know each other 15 years later. Like, what What was it like on, like, did you just talk about bubblegum on tour? What the fuck did well, you mean by that? Well, I mean that? it actually, literally, and that's why I do the podcast, is because in regular life, even when you're in a van with someone for 10 hours at a time, you tend not to, like, there's certain social conventions that prevent you from really continually digging deeper and asking certain kinds of questions without it being awkward. You know what I mean? I mean, you must find that with your podcast. Maybe right. you haven't, but uh, that's really one of the reasons, well, that that probably is the reason, the kind of anchor reason why I do this is 
is so I can have those conversations with people in my life and, you know, people that I don't know, hopefully, that right. so you can get the kind of deeper truths about, you know, <laughs> being alive that, that you kind of never get to in, in regular life. You'll see that you change with a passing of time. I know it feels strange, but you don't get to decide. You say it's your life, and I say that it's mine. We're just at different points along the same line. Okay, well, I think I got this thing fixed. The music box keeps interrupting this podcast conversation with sweet Rob Zabo jams. That one from Rob's fourth solo album in 2011, my personal favorite, the song Different Points Along the Same Line, which certainly encapsulates at least part of an essence of Rob's fine ability to resonate with people. I'm getting sentimental. Listen, this is me talking now, but I'm going to skip a very difficult-sounding attempt at a question I asked. I was asking Rob how he felt about the practice of having podcast deep conversations and how they can enhance our connection with other people. Here's Rob's response. I think it's gold. There are certain conventions that really prevent you from having a certain level of intimacy. It's just awkward. It's just not allowed. And so, but in podcasts, the kind of, you know, the barometer or whatever, the goalposts have been moved a little bit to kind of allow a different level of intimacy. In fact, it's, it's kind of encouraged in is the norm. So if if we're pa- part of that, that's in my mind a good thing. I'm, I find superficial conversation often to be just tiresome and I'm try- you try to get beyond it, but sometimes you can't. I, I think we feel the same way about that. Like the idea that the superficial conversation thing, it, it just seems f- philosophically so unnecessary and, and to do things that I, I have an understanding of being unnecessary is drawing strength away that could be used for mm-hmm. necessary things. If I think of things in those terms too much, I could almost turn into a robot. I need to balance myself, like um, find the meaning in, in doing things that might seem unnecessary when some oh, of yeah. those things are. I've thought about this a couple of times. Like we are still apes. I think a lot of that posturing really is just kind of sniffing each other's butts to kind of, you know, is this safe? Is this person safe? And you go through 20 minutes of that before you can really get to anything else. Todd, you idiot. Rob, yes, nailed it. We've been been jibber-jabbing for just over an hour now. And part of me was thinking like, I I, I really want to see inside your guts Uh emotionally. But we haven't got there yet. I have such fun with you sometimes. No, you know what? We 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 did a lot of that, but I I, I get gratification out of nerding out with my friends, and I feel like we we did that too. And it's so fun. It's hard. <laughs> well, to I'm I'm so glad. I'm I'm glad great. that you feel like. Uh, I mean, I'm having fun. I think we had fun. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, thanks so much for asking me to do it, brother. Do you feel happy about your life? <laughs> That's a big one. Huh? Uh, how long? So maybe I'm, we should start. Uh, we should. My, my we eyes should are like a, squinting. A whole other podcast for that. I mean, huh? It depends when you get me. Uh, are you fucking Doctor <laughs> Fraser Crane? No, I mean, kidding. how do you how do you answer that question? My God, I would say like I need a I need a fluffier pillow, maybe. B- well, but otherwise, what, I'm good. This weekend, <laughs> no, how kidding. I feel like, you know, it's it's my birthday weekend. And the reason I bring that up again is because, so we're locked down on quarantine, but in spite of that, I'm in a relationship that is coming close to 20 years. We're still getting along in spite of having been quarantined in really small quarters for 10 weeks. How lucky am I to be part of that? And, you know, she still puts up with me. I get along with my family. I'm relatively healthy. I live in North America at a time when... Uh, I haven't been called to war or had to go through any crazy starvation or enormous depression. I mean, we'll see how the pandemic plays out, but I I guess you see where I'm going with this, right? I haven't lived through any undue hardship. Yeah. I'm, you know, in North America, we're living in an era of unprecedented wealth and peace really. And, you know, I'm surrounded with, I have great friends. I have a wide network of amazing, supportive, fantastic, loving friends and family. And so I feel like the richest man in the world. 
am I happy? This weekend I am. Overall, and over COVID, I've been quite happy. But, you know, I go through bouts of feeling not great and, you know, borderline depressed. Why is that? I have no idea. It feels ridiculous. How do you answer that question? Right. It's it seems like it it changes it changes every day. It changes every week, and it seems ridiculous to say that when you put it in the context of the previous sixty seconds of <laughs> of utterances I've been making. Right? Like, how could you possibly be anywhere near depressed when yeah. when you live in this bounty? You're surrounded by wealth and happiness and health and all of this. Right? So, I don't know. It's a long conversation. Maybe the problem lied with the question asker because I didn't know what I wanted and I got exactly what I fucking <laughs> wanted. Uh, Rob, you're always a pleasure to talk to. Thank, thank you. Thank you for, so much, for Todd, for today. having me. And thank you for your ongoing commitment to making my podcast happen. Because again, like I said before, I, I couldn't do it without you, man. Thank you. I'd like to thank Rob once again for being on and thank you for listening. Much love. Here it is in its entirety, the quintessential uh, Rob Zabo song to enjoy in this lovely pocket of the year in Canada. From the first album again, this is Zab's summer anthem, I Live for the Summer. Bye-bye. Well, I'm loving this But I hope we don't last the summer I can't forget the chill I got last December. So I put on my mitts and I dig my trench. So much more to discover Well there always is Could we be mean to each other It gets so complex Yet we fall What is this?
the difference You need something you can measure Can't we try Or do you need an audience Well, where's your sense of adventure You know what Listening to another episode of the Todd Donald Show, starring, produced, and edited by Todd Donald. The piano music in the rap is by JP Sunga, who you can find at jpsunga.com. The theme music is Mackie Alkino by William Chernoff. Find him at chernoff.band. And I'm Milo Axelrod, Todd's favorite bar none human voice. And I'm not bragging, he wrote this. If you'd like to hear more of my voice, check out my podcast, Describing a Rock, in which I describe some rocks. You can find it wherever you listen to podcasts. Please support The Todd Donald Show by sharing it with anyone who might enjoy it. Follow and interact with at Todd Donald Show on Twitter and Instagram. And if you feel like going the extra mile on iTunes, please subscribe, rate, and review, preferably in its favor. Have a great day, friends. Thank you.